So as I mentioned, this is a second reading from the New Testament, but from the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 4 through 14, and then verses 17 through 22. And it begins this way. Now those who were scattered, the early Christian leaders, went from place to place proclaiming the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. And the crowds with one accord listened eagerly to what was said by Philip, hearing and seeing the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud shrieks, came out of many who were possessed. And many others who were paralyzed or lame were cured. And there was great joy in the city. Now a certain man named Simon had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he was someone great. All of them, from the least to the greatest, listened to him eagerly, saying, Well, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they listened eagerly to him because for a long time he'd amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip, who was proclaiming the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, then they were baptized, men and women both. And even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he stayed constantly with Philip and was amazed when he saw the signs and the great miracles that took place. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. And Peter and John laid their hands on them, and the congregation received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain God's gift with money. But you have no part or share in this, for your heart is not right before God. So repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. Friends, this is a word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, I'm going to start today with two parables, the parable of the river king and the parable of stone soup. Once upon a time, there was a king who controlled a mighty river that flowed across a wide continent. Now, this king should probably have a name, so we'll call him Jeff. And I suppose he needs a last name, so it should be something unusual that in a court of law could not be construed as libel in any way. So we'll call him Jeff Bezos Man. So one day, King Jeff Bezos Man, or King Jeff, had a brilliant idea. From his mighty palace in the north, he sent out courtiers across the land with the message that he wanted to build a second palace of profit somewhere in his kingdom. It was going to be huge, and it would greatly enrich whatever village granted him access to build there. So the chieftains and the mayors of over 200 villages in the land lusted after this prize offered by King Jeff. And they put together presentations about why they were the best. And they laid before the couriers elaborate spreads of local delicacies and tax breaks and free real estate and municipal underwriting to lure King Jeff to their village. And they also outbid all of their sisters and brothers in other villages, going so far as to expose their neighbors' secrets and liabilities so that King Jeff would shine his favor only on them. But in the end, King Jeff built his palace of profit where he'd always intended to build it, near the kingdom's eastern capital city, that he might continue to influence the elected officials who pass the laws affecting the flow of commerce on his mighty river. 
But now King Jeff knew about all the villages in the land. In fact, he'd had confidential information given to him for free so that now he could shape all of his future business decisions to maximize his personal profit. And thus he rejoiced greatly as he sat on his throne in his great palace of the north. Stone Soup. Once upon a time, an old woman sat in the village square and she stirred a cauldron of hot water with nothing in it but a stone. And curious passerbys came along and asked what she was making and she said, stone soup. And they were surprised and skeptical. And eventually they offered their contributions, whatever they could spare to make the soup perhaps resemble a soup a bit of onion or cabbage, some broth or a lamb neck bone, a handful of salt or an old carrot. And soon there was a rich stew in that pot that fed the whole village even though it had started from just a single stone. Now the chef Gabriel Hamilton recently wrote that stone soup is actually the model she uses for the family meals that her staff prepares in her own restaurant. See, the people in a restaurant's kitchen also have to eat, and the cooks assigned to create this meal are rarely given a menu ahead of time. And so what they would do is make a quick scan of the refrigerator and perhaps note that a carton of green beans was starting to fade. Now. It might seem impossible to feed an entire kitchen crew from a pile of sorry-looking green beans, but then the cook would go around to the other workers in the kitchen and beg for a few scraps, some cooked potatoes from here, or maybe a handful of sliced shallots, perhaps some cod scraps from the chef who is preparing the fish for the delicacies of that evening. And the chef would keep hunting around in the pantry perhaps locating a can of white beans that was extra, or some diced tomatoes, a bit of dried lentils, or a few extra eggs. And before long, something that started from an item almost as unappetizing as a stone would become a wonderful meal for all the staff to enjoy. Two stories, two models on how to live and interact in God's world. And I share these stories as a reminder of a simple truth. The Christian gospel is not meant to champion the status quo, but to challenge it. Our faith is not meant to simply encourage us about the way things are, but rather to offer an alternative to the way things are done, a life-giving, life-changing alternative. Now that's something you expect any preacher to say on a given Sunday. We hear those words intellectually, but the problem is, and the challenge is, how can we take them in emotionally? How can we take them to heart? Is there something that can be said or done that would move this faith language from up here to more in here? And yes, there is. Philip was an early leader in the church. He was a deacon who'd been called and set apart to care for the needy in the church. But he was also a gifted preacher traveling throughout the land to tell the story of Jesus Christ. And in time, he traveled north of Jerusalem into the region of Samaria. The Samaritans were people who believed in the God of the Old Testament and the basic teachings of Moses' law but they had intermarried over the years of the exile. And they didn't put a lot of stock in the religious leadership back in Jerusalem, which meant they were despised by the Jews in Judea. But Philip had great success in these Samaritan villages as he preached there. There were healings, there were visions, there was this spirit of great joy as they learned about the kingdom of God that had drawn near to them in Jesus Christ. And this alternative gospel that was shared, they discovered was not built around laws and old rituals, but instead around love and resurrection. 
And so as they heard about Philip's success, two of the original apostles, Peter and John, left Jerusalem and traveled to Samaria to see for themselves and to offer support to this young and fledgling faith community. And while Peter and John were there, people gathered, and they were blessed, and they were prayed over, and the Holy Spirit came to them. And the scripture uses a language that they received the Holy Spirit. And that's their way of capturing the dramatic changes that occurred in this young congregation. They were transformed. They were ecstatic. But even more so, they were now united in a way that had never been possible before through the power of the Holy Spirit and by accepting this baptism in the name of Christ. Something bigger was at work, something bigger than gender or nationality or sexual orientation or language or prestige was moving in their lives and was suddenly bringing them together. A new way of life had taken hold of them. Now, interspersed into that story is this whole second story about a magician, a wonder worker named Simon. Now, Simon had earned his living by fake cures and psychosomatic healings throughout Samaria when suddenly he too encountered this new gospel shared by Philip. And to his credit, he listened and he accepted the gospel and was baptized. To his discredit, He then thought that he could buy the gifts of the Holy Spirit from Peter and John, that he could somehow possess this ability to fill lives with purpose and with healing power and profit from it. And for that error, Simon was severely rebuked by Peter. And he begged for forgiveness, for there are some things that money just can't buy. Now again, so far, there's really nothing earth-shattering in this sermon. King Jeff seeking ever greater mounds of personal wealth versus a model of stone soup that feeds a village or a hungry kitchen staff. Philip preaching a message of hope into a community long despised. And then one man who takes this message and tries to manipulate it for personal gain, who's then rebuked while others are baptized and rejoice in a new way of life. You know, honestly, I wasn't sure how to then move this message into something that has relevance for our lives today. But then I read an essay given to me by a church member. I'm always grateful when people pass on articles to me, things that they're reading. And this came from an English novelist and poet by a man, a man named Paul Kingsnorth. Now, Kings North came to the Christian faith somewhat reluctantly, but also quite deeply as an adult. He described the process in an essay called The Cross and the Machine. He had always been a man of strong passions and advocacy in the world, especially around environmental issues. But at some point, he realized that activism alone was not enough. As he put it, if you dig long enough, you see that something like climate change or mass extinction of species is not a, quote, problem to be solved through politics or technology or science, but rather it's a manifestation of a deep spiritual malaise. He argued that every crisis of culture is actually a crisis of the spirit. And that we can go about our days as functional atheists, believing that the most important answers in the world can be found in science or in economics or in industrial profits. That the answers are there by building up our military or protecting our borders or ravaging nature for our immediate needs and wants and desires. But isn't it also clear that all of the typical worldly answers to those problems have failed. They lead to disaster. As Kings North said, this false kingdom of ours is now marked by seas ribboned with plastic, forests that are on fire, cities bulging with billionaires and homeless in tent cities. It is, as he said, 
all an expression of a spiritual malaise. The famous psychiatrist Carl Jung once wrote these words. He said, during the past 30 years, I have treated literally hundreds of patients. And among those in the second half of their life, there has not been one whose problem in the last resort was not that of finding a religious outlook on life. They had lost that which all the living religions of every age had given to their followers. And none of them has been really healed who did not regain a religious outlook. The world offers us today its parables about what life is all about. It's there on TikTok, TikTok and Facebook. It's embedded in the pop-up ads before us and the network commercials that besiege us. It's these stories about kings and palaces of prophets, about red and blue villagers at odds with each other. And over time, we have learned that these stories are not life-giving. So we become activists. We become committed to causes. We read and we join. We click on links. We share them on Twitter. We march and we lobby. We band together and occasionally win. We band together and also grow weary that things will never change. And it's in those moments that we finally hear what Philip's been saying to us that at the heart of it all is a story, a gospel, that's honest because it talks about human rebellion and then God's invitation to come home. And it's a different kind of story. It imposes limits on us that we're no longer simply to be guided by our own desires. It provides, though, a heaven-sent vision where all are fed and all are welcome. It includes a cross, a saying no to what we had believed was worthy of our awe, but then it also provides a yes to something that is truer and deeper and more perfect than anything we might have known. And see, the symbol of all of this that Philip preached and Peter and John professed is something both simple yet profound. It's the sacrament of baptism. I mean, think about it. To be baptized means you simply come forward. You renounce one world and you accept another. You reject one king while accepting a savior who's not on a throne, but a cross. Now, some people of faith have argued that baptism is only for adults. It should be too special a sacrament to be squandered on children. Where others have insisted that life is too precious to withhold this water from even the youngest of God's creatures. Both are wrong if they use their theologies to keep one another apart. Both are right if they can see something in this sacrament that changes everything how it's freely offered to all of us, how it's something money can't buy. In a moment, I'll invite you to reaffirm your baptism vows. And if you've never been baptized, then we should talk. But in these vows, there's a no to the dominant story of the world and a yes to the mystery and the wonder of the gospel of Christ. And you're not meant to fully understand it. You're invited simply to step into it, to remember being washed, to remember being named, to remember and be willing to then walk by faith with God's help. So we're going to pause for a moment to breathe and to let go and to do perhaps the most radical thing you could this Sunday morning, to remember your baptism. Amen.